Hello everyone, my name is Camille Matchley from Teach All Nations, and this is Global Pulpit, where the world is our parish. Welcome. We're going to look at a very important topic, one that we don't actually like to discuss, but frankly, it's on everybody's mind. And it's especially on everybody's mind when we have a public health crisis like pandemic. Well, the topic is death and God's attitude to death. And why doesn't God do something about it? In the United Kingdom, during normal times, I think the death rate is something like 200 persons per day. 60 million people, that's to be expected. But in a pandemic, it can go up to 800 a day, maybe 1,000 a day. Every life is important. Every person is precious. I believe we're made in the image of God. And so, of course, we grieve for such things. But bear in mind, these are people who were here yesterday, but they're not here today. Just this very week, I've had two contradictory situations happen. First of all, we heard of a dear sister in the Lord, Caroline Zidane, go on to be with God, and probably in her early 40s, I think, had cancer, Christian Arab lady from Jerusalem, and our condolences, of course, to her husband, Joseph, who's like a brother to us, to her daughter, Selena, son, Carlos, and of course, to her amazing family, Abu Anim Johnny, Johnny, his, the sisters, and all the rest. We mourn, but not like those who have no hope, because Caroline is a believer. She didn't go from light to darkness. She went from light to even greater light. Yet at the same time, two days before, I got to talk to Brother Daniel Grigorichuk. He's a Christian leader in Romania and runs the radio station, Christian radio station. I was his guest. Day after day after day in February, come March, he's at death's door in hospital from coronavirus. In fact, I got a call saying he's going to be dead any moment his vital organs, particularly his kidneys, have stopped operating. I mean, it was that dire. We prayed, we believed, and God raised him up. The whole family was stricken, his wife and his three children, teenagers, and yet God had mercy. Look, friends, I can't explain why it worked in one sense and not in another. I'm being very honest. What I don't know, I don't know. But there's a lot I've learned through God's Word. And I've learned some very fascinating things about God's attitude and response to death. And death is not exactly what you think it is. If you think it's merely a person who stops breathing, heart stops beating, they go stone cold, and then you bury them, and that's death. Well, yes and no. Because actually, we're going to learn what the real nature of death is and what God has done about it. So I want to turn your attention to a very wonderful passage of Scripture from 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10. 2 Timothy is the last book written by the Apostle Paul. He probably himself was on death row. But he doesn't seem to be worried or have any fear for his own life because he doesn't see the termination of his physical life as being the end. In fact, this is the man who said in Scripture that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So he had no fear of death anyway. In fact, in Philippians, he says, I'd rather die sooner because I want to be with Christ. But I need to hang around a little longer here on earth for your benefit. That was his attitude. And Paul, I believe, got it right. So let me read to you that one verse, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10. But has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. When it talks about our Savior, Jesus Christ, did you hear what it said? Jesus didn't just overcome death. Jesus abolished death, and he brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now, friends, either this is delusional, or it's hardcore spiritual reality, and something that will change our thinking, renew our mind, 
fill our spirit, and help us to overcome the challenges we face. Let me explain to you, what did Jesus Christ actually overcome when it comes to the fact of overcoming death? Well, first of all, he overcame the reign of death. Romans 5, 17, it tells us something to the effect that by one man, his disobedience, of course, implying Adam, by one man, death has reigned. And let me say that death's reign is a reign of terror. It brings fear, it brings darkness, it brings dread. It's, as the Bible rightly calls it, the last enemy. And so, yes, it had a reign of terror. But Romans 5.17 goes on to say, But through one has reigned unto life. So if you're still under Adam's curse, then sin and death is a real horrible prospect. But if you're under Christ, you're under his reign for life. Remember what Jesus said to the Sadducees who gave him the ridiculous question of what do you do about one woman who married five brothers, all of them were childless, she's the last to die, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? He says, you are in error. You do not know the scriptures or the power of God. And then it goes on to tell us, and remember that this is to prove the dead rise, because Moses was told at the burning bush, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but no, they're dead now, so that connection is severed. No, no, he still is. And then Jesus goes on to say, for all are alive in him, meaning all that belong to him, those that are under the covenant, the new covenant. That's why the reign of terror is over for those under Christ. That's the first thing. Then he abolishes death by abolishing the darkness. In the book of Job, Job likens death and darkness hand in glove. They go together. It's kind of like not just you close your eyes and it's dark, but they put you in a box and close the door and it's dark, put you in a grave and it's dark. And it's all dark. And that's how it is spoken of from Job's perspective. But that's not how it works. According to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4, it tells us that when Jesus moved from Nazareth to Capernaum, it was a fulfillment of the book of Isaiah, that the people who dwelt in darkness have seen a great light. And to them who have lived in the shadow of death, upon them the light has shined. In other words, yes, death was present. The darkness with it is also present. But the light that Christ brings is brighter than the darkness of death. And it indeed overcomes. We have a third thing. Christ vanquishes death. Well, how does he do that? It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 54 and onward, that death is the last enemy, and it has been vanquished, and we'll see later that its sting has been broken. It is a defeated foe. Oh yes, it's still around, but it's not serving its own purpose, inflicting terror, inflicting darkness, inflicting sting. Oh no, it's been co-opted to usher God's people from a sin-riddled world into the presence of the Almighty, to the throne room of grace. It is vanquished. Because after all, either sin and death have been dealt a death blow at Calvary, or we're in very, very big trouble. We learn also that the sting of death is gone. I don't know if you've ever been bitten by a bee, or stung, I should say, as well as stung by a hornet. Not very nice, and it can throb for a long time. Well, death is like that, only much, much worse. And it can plague people many years, maybe perhaps for the rest of their lives. The sting of death, of losing a loved one, especially losing them tragically in an untimely manner. And how am I going to get on with life? And amazingly, people can, but the shadow is there. 
and the sting is in place. But according to that same 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the sting of death is taken. It's not just that the stinger is removed. There's a healing. There's a comfort. There's a joy. And so the sting is gone. Jesus abolishes death through the removal of the sting, the removal of the darkness. He abolishes death by the removal of the separation. Very important point here. Death, in its purest sense, means exactly that. Death means separation. In this case, not just separation of a loved person from their loved ones, friends, and family. That is part of it. But it also tells us in James chapter 2, verse 26, that the body without the spirit is dead. So physical death is when our human spirit departs from our body. It goes to its place, and the body goes to its place. There is a separation. But we understand that that separation is not eternal. It is temporal. There will come a time that all the dead will rise. We not only learn that in Daniel chapter 12, all the dead will rise, the righteous and the unrighteous, but we also learn that in John chapter 5, that the dead shall hear his voice, all of them. There will be two different destinations, but everyone will rise, and everyone will get the body, and then everyone will go from there. Stand before God and be assigned their place according to their works. But there's something else. The sting of death and the separation of death has been abolished through Christ. Because death doesn't separate you from God. According to Romans chapter 8, Verses 35 to 38, Paul says, Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Good question. Well, the short answer is nothing and no one. And then he goes on to say, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels or principalities or powers or things present or things to come or height or depth or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He says, I am persuaded. Neither death nor life can separate us. If the true, bona fide, fundamental definition of death is separation, then Jesus abolishes death by taking away that separation. Because remember, death ultimately means separation from the source of life. When a believer dies, they are not separated from the source of life. On the contrary, they are catapulted into the presence of the source of life. We learn in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. If the Lord is the source of life, which of course he is, he's the Lord of life, the author of life, the prince of life, then physical death actually makes you more alive because you're in God's presence than you are even right now. Separation is abolished. The separation of death through Christ. And then death can often mean hopelessness. It's a horrible feeling, isn't it? Hopelessness. My loved one is gone. Now, of course, I'm addressing people of faith, but I'm even addressing people who are not yet in the faith, because God loves you just as much as he loves people in the faith. But there is a hopelessness. Well, Jesus abolishes the hopelessness, because in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says, I want to comfort you, brethren. I want to help you. I want to make you understand what happens to your departed loved ones so that you do not grieve as those that have no hope. Believers don't have to grieve like those with no hope because we are given a living hope, an anchor to the soul. Why? Well, you see, I would say to my dear brother Joseph, you haven't lost Caroline. You've only lost contact with her temporarily. That's all you've lost. Though the separation is painful, especially at the beginning, it's at best only temporal. 
you will see her again. And the good news is the reunion will be not for time, but for eternity. Yes, the hopelessness of death has been abolished through Jesus Christ. And then fear. We live with the issue of fear. It's a very big issue. It's something the Bible addresses head on. And I can tell you right now, God doesn't want his people to be afraid of anything. Think about it in Matthew 24, when Jesus is giving the signs of the times preceding his return. He talks about earthquakes, famines, pestilence, wars and rumors of wars. And virtually in the same breath, he says, but see that you are not troubled. It tells us in Hebrews 2, verse 15, that people, because of their fear of death, have been in bondage all their lives. And Christ delivers us from the fear, the torment, the torture, the darkness, the intimidation, the bullying even of death. And that's why King David said in the 23rd Psalm, he says in verse 4, Yea, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. What is the basis of such confidence when the shadows of death are enveloping you by the moment, especially with those quick sundowns in the Judean wilderness? Well, there is a good reason for his confidence. He says, for thou art with me. When God is with you and God is for you, Nothing and no one can be against you. Therefore, the sting of fear and of death is abolished in Christ. Well, that leads me to the last one. It's very special. It's called grief turns to joy. In Psalm 30, he says, I will turn my morning into dancing, or you will turn my morning. It's God. Turn, it takes the morning, and I don't mean a.m., I mean morning in grief, and turns it to gladness. He gives us beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. But there's a wonderful verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and I believe it's verse 10, just a phrase out of that verse, sorrowful yet ever rejoicing. How on earth can we be rejoicing when we've lost a loved one? Well, we can rejoice that they're no longer in pain. We can rejoice they're no longer in the darkness. We can rejoice that they aren't going to be tormented by sting that comes from death. We can rejoice there's no fear. We can rejoice they're in the presence of the Lord and in God's presence, Psalm 1611, is fullness of joy, and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Well, his presence, of course, is in heaven, although he can and is present with his people too, here on earth. So we have some wonderful, celestial, hardcore promises. Jesus Christ really has abolished death. That's why he says so confidently in John chapter 11, verses 25 and 27, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Jesus gives that verse and then he asks Martha point blank, do you believe this? Martha said, yes. And her brother Lazarus rose from the dead. Friends, I share this with you because it's an issue we all have to understand, but especially understand it from God's point of view. He loves you. He wants to give you life and immortality, and that can be gloriously yours through the gospel. Remember that Jesus, the Prince of Life, tasted of death on our behalf. He was separated from God. He saw the darkness. He saw the torment. He had the sting. He took all that with him, so we don't have to have it at all. He defeated death and abolished it through his own death, 
and his glorious resurrection. If you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose again for your justification, and you haven't asked him into your life as yet, I invite you, don't waste another minute. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. And furthermore, furthermore, let's open our hearts wide and let the King of glory, the resurrection and the life, come in. Join me in prayer. Thank you, Father, for the fact that our Savior, Jesus, has abolished death. We don't want death. We don't want sin. We don't want sorrow and sighing. We want to be fearless. We want to be walking with you and connected to your glorious promises and to dwell in your house and in your kingdom forever. Therefore, we acknowledge that of ourselves, we are sinners needing your grace but we thank you for the free gift of the gospel of Christ. We acknowledge that Christ died for our sins, was buried, rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, so that as we believe this, and we do believe this, and receive him, we have the new birth, forgiveness of sins, and the gift of eternal life. We thank you for this in Christ Jesus the Lord. Amen.